off the side. I just want to thank you all for coming out this afternoon to hear Mr. Napier's presentation. Um, two quick announcements. Please make sure that your cell phones are on silent. Uh, and then there are going to be some clipboards passed around. We'd like to have a record of all the people who came this afternoon. So if you could please sign in with your information, we would appreciate it. And now Dr. Wilder is going to introduce the speaker. Thank you, Mary Elizabeth. Uh, let me just start off by expressing my appreciation to all of you folks for being here this afternoon. I know it's a Friday afternoon, and there's many other wonderful things to be doing, but I uh, really appreciate you all being here today. I'm pretty sure uh, you are not going to be disappointed. Uh, before, we, uh, before I introduce our speaker, let me make uh, a couple of uh, announcements. First off, uh, thank you to Dr. Shaw our Bay Alpha Psi chapter for serving as our host today. Uh, Mary Elizabeth, I know, has uh, done a lot uh, as well, and I have an outstanding Bay Alpha Psi chapter, award-winning, and appreciate uh, your role in hosting today's activities. Uh, number two, uh, most of y'all may not be aware of this, but the School of Accountancy uh, was established in 1979 as a separate independent school. So 2019 represents our 40 year anniversary as a separate school. We're, we're gonna be doing a few things this year to celebrate that and uh, today's lecture is one of those things. So uh, just wanted to make you aware of that. That'll be a theme uh, you hear throughout the next several months. A uh, third thing I wanted to mention is that uh, today's lecture is sponsored by the H.E. Uh, Eugene Peary Sherman and Celia Youth Lecture Series Endowment. Uh, most of y'all may not know uh, who Professor Peary was, longtime legendary accounting professor here at Ole Miss, about 45 years or so. Dr. Davis is now uh, outdistanced. Um, Mr. Peary, but uh, uh, Mr. Peary made a huge impact on the lives of many, many of our graduates. Uh, so wanted to make you aware of that and uh, also appreciative to Sherman and Celia uh, for their generosity in establishing uh, this endowment in the accounting school. So now let's uh, introduce, our, introduce our guest of honor. Uh, very pleased to have Mr. Burt Napier with us today. Several of us uh, old timers remember well when uh, Burke was walking the halls of Old Connor. This is before Holman was built and the renovated Connor uh, that we're in now. Y'all might not have even known it was a renovated Connor. But uh, anyway, Burke graduated with his bachelor's degree in 96, master's of tax in 97, spent about seven years in public accounting in Memphis. Uh, several of those were with Arthur Anderson. Uh, last couple of years with Ernst & Young. I believe he was on the FedEx. Uh, that was a client of his throughout his term uh, there. He spent a couple of years with uh, Wright Technology in Memphis before landing with uh, FedEx in 2005. Uh, over about an 11 year period, had several different prom promotions. I'll uh, read these titles, Director of Financial Reporting with FedEx, uh, then Vice President and Corporate Controller, and then promoted to Vice President Global Integration. May of 16, Burt moved to the Netherlands. So he's been living there uh, a little over three years, or about three years. Uh, promoted to Senior Vice President of Finance and International CFO. In 2018, he assumed his current role which is President of FedEx Express Europe, CEO of TNT. So he's based in the Netherlands, uh, leads a team of 49,000 uh, professionals, so uh, very impressive. Uh, we're very pleased to have some special guests with us today. I want to introduce these folks. So uh, Bert's parents are with us, uh, Herb and Kat, uh, Kathy Napier and uh, Herb actually played baseball here at Ole Miss in some glory days. Uh, was on the 1972 team that won the SEC, went to the College World Series, and we had not gone to the College World Series since 1972 until about five years ago. So really pleased to have Burke and Kathy with us, Herbert. 
Uh, also pleased to have a couple of uh, Burke's classmates. We've been calling them bodyguards today, but uh, Oliver Dowdy and Jay Oliphant, uh, pleased to have y'all here. Also pleased to have Ashley Allen with us. Ashley uh, works for FedEx, is about to be transitioning into a communications advisor role, uh, assisting Burt in that area. So thank you all for being here. Let's uh, give a big welcome to our guest of honor, Mr. Burt Napier. some kind of class credit for being here <laughs> on a Friday afternoon at 3 o'clock, and so I admonish every professor that's in this room to ensure that you're getting some kind of benefit for being here to see me, but it's a tremendous honor and privilege to be invited back. Uh, it's a thrill to be here on campus. I want to thank Dr. Wilder and the entire faculty for inviting me back and hosting me today. I saw many of you this morning, uh, and so it was good to see a group of students. I'll try not to repeat myself too much and talk about some different things this afternoon. But really excited, it's my first time back on campus uh, since I moved to Europe. So a lot has changed. The last time I was here was for some football games in the fall of 2015. So a lot has changed since I've been back <laughs> on campus. Uh, I heard about your new building coming soon for the accounting school. Uh, so there's a lot of great things happening uh, in the accounting school. And it's certainly transformed uh, since Jay and Oliver and I were here many, many years ago, 22 years ago, uh, the prestige of this uh, program and this school has grown exponentially over the last several years. Uh, and it's just really proud now to be a part of something that was so special at the time, uh, but is really tremendously special now as well. I'll do a quick intro just a little bit beyond what Dr. Walter talked about, uh, tell you about where I'm from, uh, where I grew up, how I ended up at Ole Miss. Uh, I did go to Ole Miss, graduated in 97, Dr. Wilder said I went to Arthur Anderson and stayed there for five years, two years at Ernst & Young. My only client pretty much the entire time was FedEx. So I have very, very deep roots uh, back to FedEx and have now been at FedEx for the last 14 years. Uh, grew up all over the U.S. Uh, my dad was in sales for many years in the steel industry. I was born in Youngstown, Ohio. So if I don't sound like I'm exactly from here, that's why. Uh, we lived in Cleveland, we lived in Pittsburgh, we lived in Houston, we lived in uh, Franklin, Tennessee, which is just outside of Nashville. I came here, I went to Memphis for 20 years, and then I moved to Europe. Uh, so we've been, I've been in Europe for the last four years, I was there for a year by myself, uh, and then my family came and joined me three years ago. So, been all over, uh, son of an Ole Miss dad, uh, and I'll give you the only bad news of the afternoon son of an Auburn mom, <laughs> but we love her to death. Uh, she has a better football team than we do right now, but uh, hopefully uh, we're turning the corner on that front as well. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about a few things today, uh, just give you some perspectives in terms of what I think about Ole Miss. Dr. Wilder asked me to title my speech, uh, which was a really big stretch because I don't very often title speeches. And what I've decided to call it, uh, playing on my roots at FedEx, is what Ole Miss delivers. Uh, and so you know, thinking about what this university has delivered to me, uh, and what this university delivers to all of us, and has delivered to all of us over the years. Before I do that, I just want to give you some context for the business, uh, the FedEx business. How many people know what FedEx does? All right, that's fantastic. All right, the reason I ask is because uh, the FedEx business in Europe for many years uh, was one that wasn't as strong as it is as a brand in, in the U.S. FedEx in Europe uh, was the number five player until about three years ago. And I used to check into hotels when I first started going to Europe. And I'd hand uh, my business card, my passport, and my credit card uh, to be checked in. And there were many times where the person checking me in uh, would look at my business card and say, well, what does FedEx do? All right, and when you come from the U.S. and you work for FedEx and everybody knows exactly what happens, uh, it's very humbling to work in Europe and realize that you're not part of that story. So FedEx in Europe transformed three years ago, and I'll, I'll talk about this a little bit more later. We bought a company uh, called TNT, a Dutch company, and uh, we did that to improve our position in the European landscape. Number five wasn't going to make us competitive. Uh, our number one competitor 
in Europe is a company called DHL, uh, the yellow and red guys, as I like to call them. Then there's my other favorite, the brown guys. You guys know who the, those guys are. Uh, and so we're trying to catch up to a place where uh, we weren't very competitive, and we did that through a very large acquisition. The largest in the history of FedEx, a $5 billion deal in 2016. Uh, and we did that as well on the back of being the largest acquisition in the history of our industry. And we did that really because we needed to catch up in terms of where we're going in that marketplace. The business that I run in Europe is a big business. It's a $9 billion business. It's got uh, 50,000, 49,000 team members. We do 14 million shipments a night at FedEx, and 2.2 million shipments of those are in Europe. We've got 1,000 stations, so that's a location where a package comes in and then it's put on a van and taken back to your house. We've got 1,000 of those stations across Europe uh, in 50 different countries. So we've got a great business in Europe. We're building Europe's premier logistics business, and we're really focused on growth. Uh, and I tell you all that because it'll give you some context for different things that I talk about uh, later this afternoon. When you think about Ole Miss and you think about coming here to this fantastic university, uh, one of the things that I thought about as I was reflecting on what I would say today and giving my speech a title, which is probably the hardest thing I had to do, was the things that I didn't even realize about this university when I left here and what it had given me in terms of what it actually delivered and what I took away. You don't think about that. It's really hard to think about that right now. You guys are all enjoying a fantastic experience. You're enjoying being here. There's a great social aspect to this university, but you're also part of a premier program. And so I thought about that, and I said, okay, well, what, what can I say that really tells somebody what they realize when they leave that this place delivered to them? And the first thing I'll tell you, there's two things, two big things, and I'll talk about some <coughs> The first thing I'll tell you is the foundation. And the greatest thing that you can tell your parents by becoming an accounting major is that you're always going to have a job. All right, you're 100% employable from here on out. This university and this program gives you a foundation in terms of having a degree that you can never not use for something. And that always may be accounting, or you may turn it into something else. You may move into HR, you may move into IT, you may move into marketing, but the foundation you're getting is something that you're always going to have for the rest of your life. And I've got a great story about my wife. I married an old Miss girl. Uh, she was also an accounting major. And about halfway through, uh, she had just finished Dr. Davis's class. And she called her dad, my father-in-law. And she said, all right, so this tells you how bad Davis's class was, all right? <laughs> she calls her dad and she says, Dad, I want to be a travel agent. He's like, no. <laughs> She's like, I, I can't do accounting. I can't do it. It's too hard. He's like, a travel agent? Why would you be a travel agent? She said, I just can't do accounting anymore. And he said, no, you're not going to be a travel agent. Think about where, how many travel agents do we use today. Think about how that model changed over time. And he went back to her and said, look, just finish. Grind it out and just finish and get your accounting degree because you're always going to be able to get a job. And that's true. So the foundation that you've got today, whether you're an accountant in 20 years or whether you're a CEO of a business like me in 20 years, this foundation is invaluable. And it's because of what it teaches you about the core of business, about finance and running a business and understanding a business, but working in a field that teaches you about business acumen. And it's business acumen that's going to make you invaluable over going to make you have an ability to contribute to a business or grow into a different part of the business. The second thing I would tell you is relationships. Relationships are critical. And relationships are one of the most important things that you learn about in this university. How important is your relationship with these professors? You guys can interact. It's okay. I know it's Friday afternoon. You think it's important? Yeah? What about, you think they're talking to potential employers? Yes, they are talking to a potential employer. Do you want them to say good things about you? You guys aren't very energetic. <laughs> Look guys, stocks, all of you, they don't want you to say anything positive about them. <laughs> These relationships that you build teach you something about building relationships over your career. 
you guys invest in these guys, they're investing in you. They invested in me. They invested in Jay. They invested in Oliver. And it's an important lesson as you leave because it's relationships that are going to continue to advance your career. Even, that, even when you don't have any idea, and you may not find it out until very later. I've got lifelong friends I made in accounting. We got back together for the first time in about a year last night. We picked up right where we left off. I saw Dr. Davis last night from City Grocery. First person I saw when I got to Oxford. I knew it was an omen. <laughs> <laughs> and we picked up like we'd never missed a beat over the last several years. But it's these relationships that you're going to take away that are so important to moving forward. And, and I had a partner that I worked for at Ernst and Young. His name was Mike Becker. And Mike was a 63-year-old Ernst and Young partner from New York who had always worked on airline clients at Ernst and Young. One of the hardest partners I've ever worked for in my life. He was old school public accounting. He'd been doing accounting since he graduated from college at age 21, and he was 63. All right, that's a long time to be an Ernst and Young partner and do accounting. And he ate, drank, and, and slept about accounting. He used to tell me that you should be thinking about improvements for the client while you ate your breakfast. <laughs> Okay? Look, when I eat my breakfast, I want to see what's going on in my email. I want to see what's going on in social media. I don't want to think about my clients. But this is what that guy believed in. He was as hard on me as any boss I, as, that I've ever had. And when I left Houston <coughs> Young, I really didn't appreciate him or our relationship. Because I left thinking, gosh, he just he never liked me. He was always so hard on me. And little did I know, he ended up being the guy that got me the job that I got when I first went into FedEx. So FedEx had originally hired into my entry role, the Director of Financial Reporting in 2005, had originally hired a gentleman that was working at Delta in Atlanta. And at the very last minute, right before you were supposed to show up for the job, he and his wife decided they couldn't leave Atlanta and move to Memphis. It was too big of a stretch. Couldn't leave Cosmopolitan, Memphis, or Atlanta, and move to Little Memphis. So FedEx is left hanging at the ninth hour with nobody to take this really, really important call. And Mike Becker picked up the phone and called my first boss and said, you know what? This kid made an impression on me. He worked for me. His name's Bert Nature. You remember him. He worked on the account. You should call him. I think he'd be a great fit. I didn't find that story out until two years after I started at FedEx. I had no idea. So you make relationships as you move along. And what this university <coughs> gave me, what it delivered to me that I didn't realize at the time, was the importance of relationships and the value of relationships and how they're going to come back. Now look, I, I haven't done this perfectly. I've burned plenty of bridges along the way. All right, I'm passionate. I'm opinionated. I'm driven, and that means you're going to hurt some feelings. But I hope I can just give you that data point and that little reminder that start your investments here. They're going to grow out of this staff, and this faculty, and they're going to continue to build as you move through your career. Now, I want to share a few perspectives, a few things that I think I can leave you guys. Uh, we can talk about and reflect uh, for a little bit. Three things I really want to share uh, as we think about what I learned here and then how it applied in my career and, and how I've ended up along the way. And I'll save some time in a little while for some questions, let you guys ask some questions. But one of the first things I want to talk about is adversity. Uh, so when you think about adversity, uh, you're going to have it in your career. You're going to face adversity. It's just, an, it's just a part of what's going to happen. Uh, look, I've been tremendously blessed in my career, in my professional and, and personal life. I have a wife, we've been together for 18 years, we have two children. Uh, I have a 15-year-old daughter, uh, so if you want to stop and pray for me now, <laughs> I'm happy to do that. Um, and I'm talking about their grandchildren, so I may get slaughtered later. <laughs> but I have a 15-year-old daughter, Caroline, and I have a positively delightful eight-year-old son. So in accounting terms, I have a debit and a credit. <laughs> but truly, 
truly blessed. That doesn't mean that my career of going through and being at Arthur Anderson and being at Ernst & Young and then being at FedEx and having a role like international CFO and now being the president of a very large business, it hasn't all been perfect. And I never want anybody to think that. I was at Arthur Anderson when it went bankrupt. Who could imagine that an accounting firm of that stature and size, 80,000 employees, would go bankrupt in the spring of 2002? My company, in the summer of 2017, was attacked by the most catastrophic cyber attack in the history of commerce. It nearly destroyed my business. Interesting fact, what, how did I get the virus? Does anybody know how I got the virus? An email? Close. Tax software. The tax software that my company uses in the Ukraine was the point of entry. It's a little counting fact for you. That fantastic tax system we were using in the Ukraine was the point of entry for a cyber attack that evaporated in four minutes nearly 40,000 PCs, 7,000 servers, and 3,000 applications that run my transportation business. People came in, and you guys think about your day, all right? What's the first thing you do when you get up? What do you grab? I don't have mine because I don't usually carry it around. But you grab your phone, okay? Employees in finance come in, they use a phone, they use a computer, they check their email, they send spreadsheets, they check the ledger, gone. If you were in accounting in June of 2017, you came in the office and you had absolutely, positively nothing to do, because you couldn't. Catastrophic cyber attack. And so your career is not going to be promotion, recognition, promotion, recognition. We rebuilt an $8 billion TNT business from scratch in 102 days. Because everything you do in a transportation company is underpinned by a computer. Scheduling an airline, scheduling a package pickup, scheduling a delivery, it's all generated by computers. We had to rebuild all that so we get our business back on its feet. So you're going to face adversity as you go through your career, but there's gonna be a lot of great things too. One of the very first really tough life lessons that I learned was here at Ole Miss. In uh, my sophomore year, uh, I was part of a fraternity here, I'll let it stay nameless, and there were some not great things happening inside the fraternity house, things that were dangerous, and I decided, along with a few other of my uh, fraternity brothers, to go and make a report to the national fraternity and the dean of students. And these things were illegal, the things that were happening. And an investigation was launched. The national fraternity came in. The dean of students investigated it. And the result was that I was kicked out of my fraternity. Stunned. First really tough life lesson because I could not how I comprehend how I got kicked out of, it, of a fraternity for standing up for what I believe was right. And the life lesson there is that along the way in your career, you're going to have opportunities to do things that aren't right. I can promise you. You're gonna have an opportunity, something's gonna happen, somebody's gonna ask you to do something, you're gonna know it's not right, and it may be tempting. But I did the right thing when I was in that fraternity, and I paid the consequences for it. I can now see the benefit of it, because I would have never met these guys, because we met, because we had to live together, because I wasn't living in the fraternity house. <laughs> It was painful at the time. But the life lesson is I would not know these two guys who are some of my best friends in the world. And you're going to have that adversity that comes along the way. But you have to figure out what the lesson is when it happens. Second big point of adversity uh, is a professional event. So I went to Arthur Anderson. And you already heard that I'm confident, I'm passionate, uh, I'm driven, I'm motivated, and so I did a very rare accomplishment at Arthur Anderson. I made it to audit senior in 18 months. 
six months ahead of what was normal. And so what did I think I was? Hot what? <laughs> right? You guys can fill in the blank. <laughs> so I decided that I would do the next thing that had never really happened, which was make audit manager in four years. Because not really anybody had done that. A handful of people. And only the best and the brightest and the most talented had made it in four years. Well, if I'd made senior in 18 months, I was definitely going to do that one. And guess what? It didn't happen. And so what was I when it didn't happen? Well, how was I feeling? Sad? Happy? Upset? <laughs> yeah, I was pretty mad. And I had decided that I was going to quit. Forget this. Forget this place. You can't see my talent. I'll take my show somewhere else. I was a little cocky too. <laughs> so a guy named Brian Roberson called him, manager at the firm, he'd been a manager for some time. He knew I was upset. <coughs> Talked to him, he said, let's go have breakfast. And you know what he told me at breakfast? He told me to grow up. He said, it's not about your title. It's not about whether you did or didn't get promoted. It's about your responsibilities. You're the lead audit senior on a FedEx engagement. It's the premier client of this firm. So why are you worried about whether your title is manager or whatever? Just go do good things. And the rest will take care of itself. And he told me to grow up, and he taught me a great lesson. Now here's the most important thing about that story. A year later, Arthur, Arthur Anderson was embroiled in the biggest accounting fraud in the history of the industry with Enron. And on March 8th, well before Arthur Anderson went out of business later that summer, FedEx fired Arthur Anderson because they didn't want to be associated with the brand and the reputation at the time of Arthur Anderson because that's how important the FedEx brand is. FedEx was the third company to fire Anderson, and Anderson is still saying, we're going to be here, and we're going to be just fine. Arthur Anderson is fired. Everybody on that team lost their client. So I effectively lost my job, because I didn't have anything to work on anymore. And immediately, Ernst & Young called me. He said, hey, we want you to come across and be on the EY team that's taking over the FedEx account. And that made a lot of sense to me. Now, the important part of Brian Roberson telling me to grow up, and part of the kind of interesting aspect of this story, is that FedEx management prohibited Ernst & Young from hiring anyone with a manager title or above <coughs> So my cockiness and my ambition, if I had kept pushing that, I wouldn't be standing here. The last two years that I worked at Ernst & Young, I forged a relationship with the guy that hired me at FedEx in 2005. Those two years at Ernst & Young were critical <coughs> because I would have never made it in the door at FedEx. And I would not be here in front of you guys talking about what was happening in the business in Europe for FedEx. And so you're going to have adversity. It's going to happen. But the biggest thing about adversity is how you turn adversity into advantage. How do you figure out what the lessons are in adversity? The second thing I want to talk to you about is preparation. I can't tell you how important preparation is. We talked about this a little bit this morning. Preparation is something that you're always going to take away from this university. I asked this question this morning a couple of times. How many people would go to a stocks exam and wing it? He can't see you. He's not going to turn around. If you want to wing it, raise your hand. <laughs> How many people would do that? Nobody. You might do it for Davis. <laughs> Nobody would go into any one of your professors and wing it for an exam. This place demands too much. 
This place asks too much. And this place teaches you how to prepare. You have to prepare for the research. You have to prepare for the test. You have to prepare for the interview. How many people go into interviews right now? It's a lot. You going up there? I see a lot of heads. They're not in this. But you feel prepared, right? You feel prepared. Preparation and being <coughs> relentless about preparation is something that this university teaches you. If you go into public accounting, it's something that that apprenticeship model will teach you. It's a part of the fiber and the DNA of the environment of being an accountant. And so that's something that this university, I've always taken away from this university. And so a lot of people, when I'm, I'm talking, they'll ask me, hey, what's a great business book? Tell me about a great business book I can go read. Has anybody read a business book? It's OK, Caroline, raise your hand. Was it any good? Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> Most business books, you guys have read business books. Are they any good? Mm, not really. All right. All right, I got one business book I'm going to recommend to you. All right. It's almost not a business book, because it's almost a children's story. It's a fake. It's about 100 pages long. It is technically a business book, and it's called Our Iceberg is Melting. And it's told through the prism of a colony of penguins. And the lead penguin is named Fred. Now, I obviously like that, because our chairman and founder is Fred Smith, so there's some resonating aspects of this story. But our iceberg is melting is about a colony of penguins whose iceberg is what? Nothing. And the chief council of penguins is sitting in a meeting room and doesn't believe that the iceberg is melting. And Fred, who's an adventurous, curious penguin, likes to wander around the iceberg and walk around and see what's happening. And he goes out to the furthest point of the iceberg, and he realizes that there's a hole in the bottom of the iceberg, and the iceberg is melting. And the hole is going to fill with what? And when it refreezes, what will happen? You guys are really smart. You don't have to be physics or chemists or anything to figure this out. When the hole fills with water and it freezes again, what will happen to the iceberg? It'll explode. So Fred goes and keeps telling the council, our iceberg is melting. We're all going to die. No, you're crazy, Fred. And the chief of the penguin colony was a penguin appropriately named No No. And so he repeatedly goes back. He tries to take evidence. He's prepared. He's relentless. He's prepared. And the chief penguin No No says No. So Fred, in his preparation, begins to enlist other penguins. Okay. He enlists another penguin to go out. Her name's Alice. They go look. Alice comes back with Fred and says, there's a hole in the iceberg. It's melting. We're going to all die. No. He does this repeatedly until he convinces enough of the other penguins to go back to the council. And the council goes out to the hole, sees the hole, and knows that they cannot stay on an iceberg anymore. And you know what happened after that in this story? They moved every year to a new iceberg. It's a business book. It's about a story. It's about being relentlessly prepared. And you'll be amazed when you get into the working world how many people are not. We pride ourselves at FedEx on detail, on preparation, on being on time. And I can't tell you how many meetings I go to talk about something very serious with another party or another, somebody else not FedEx across the table, and I'm astonished when they're not prepared, and you think you're going into this really difficult negotiation, and you're ready to go, and it becomes a cakewalk because the other party didn't bother to get ready, and we end up being very successful. I can't tell you how important preparation is. Preparation also doesn't come with success. Sometimes it comes with failure. My best professional example is that about a year and a half after I was promoted to vice president, I got an opportunity to interview for a senior vice president job. 
right? I had no business whatsoever. Uh, my cockiness had gone away at this point, okay? So as, as exciting as I thought that was, I had no business being a part of a conversation for a senior vice president role at FedEx after only being a vice president for a year and a half. And plus, at the time, I was 35. There were no 35-year-old senior vice presidents at FedEx. But our CFO, a man named Alan Graff, called me and said, Joey's retiring. You're going to interview for Joey's job. Joey was the senior vice president at the time. And Alan is our CFO, executive vice president. If Alan calls you and tells you you're going to do something, you're going to do it. No idea in my mind why I'm being asked to participate in a process in which I have no chance of winning. Literally none. Because the two other candidates in this process were the people who had been waiting for this senior vice, vice president to retire for 30 years. They were the two sitting vice presidents of the organization who were thinking to themselves, finally, he retires. Now I get my shot. These two guys knew more about that function in that area of the business than I could learn in the six weeks I had to get ready for the interview. And they forgot more about it than I could learn. Three people, two people incumbent, me from the outside, but at the same time, can you afford right now for you guys interviewing to go to an interview unprepared? <clears throat> Could I afford to go to that interview that I had no chance of winning unprepared? Because if I went in there unprepared, even though I knew I couldn't win, what would the impression have been on that panel of people that would have said, well, Mark doesn't care about So we won't consider him for anything else down the road. So I have to invest. I have to go do my homework. I have to get prepared. And guess what? I didn't get it. And the only thing I can tell you in, in that was that being prepared allowed me to have a good showing, and losing and failing helped me build a muscle that I would need later in my career. And I could look back and know now that there was something about that experience that was really, really important. And it was the way I prepared for it. And that even when I knew I wasn't going to be successful, it was still important to make a good impression. Now, the third thing I want to tell you before we open it up for some questions is the perspective of saying yes when saying yes makes no sense in the world. How many people came here as an accounting major? Let me ask it a different way. How many people in this room who are accounting majors were convinced to become an accounting major after you got to Ole Miss? Now, I would like for all of you guys, keep your hands up for me. I'd like for the faculty to turn around and look at this. All right, you guys put your hands down. One, I'd just like to say something to you guys, and I said this at lunch. You guys are fantastic. I mean, think about that. That's like 60% of this room because of the amazing faculty we have here in this school who believe in what we do, believe in this profession, believe in this school so much that they're out actively recruiting you to join this function, join this team, after you've gotten on campus. Now, I could have raised my hand because I too showed up here not as an accounting major. I showed up here as a political science major, whatever that means. <laughs> and to, their, to their great anguish, when I came here about what I was going to do in my life. And I took Accounting 101 from Dr. Davis, Napier. The answer you're looking for is not on the floor. Have you heard it? You don't have to admit it. Dr. Davis, 101, aced the class. And as I'm leaving for the semester to go home, he convinces me to take him for accounting 102. Now, how many people would do that? How many people would say, you know what, I just had Dr. Davis, let me have it. Let me double down and take him again the next semester. 
It didn't make any sense to me at all. I was like, oh, I survived. You know? He's like, you have a talent for this, and you don't know it. And I expect to see you. This is what he said. I expect to see you in my class in January. And so what do you say to that? <laughs> Take accounting 102, fall in love with accounting, end up in intermediate, and the rest is that I got an accounting degree and it set me on a path that's been absolutely amazing. But saying yes to him didn't make any sense to me in the world. Being an accountant didn't make any sense to me in the world. I couldn't, I didn't even know what accounting was when I came to work. And so saying yes to something when it doesn't make any sense in the world is part of what this university teaches you, and it's going to be important later. So let me give you a professional example. I told you guys that in 2015, we announced the acquisition of TNT, largest acquisition in the history of FedEx, transformational in our industry, historic, $5 billion acquisition. And at the time, I was the corporate controller, vice president of corporate control. I had been the controller for six years, I enjoyed what I was doing. I was doing something that these guys had all prepared me to do, and I was doing it well. Another important fact is that UPS, our largest competitor, had dropped, tried to buy TNT a year before and failed. They were blocked by the European Commission because of concerns over competitive issues in Europe. So we announced this great acquisition We've got some risk because our competitor tried to buy it and failed. There's no guarantee that we will be successful. And I had been at the University of Pittsburgh the morning of the announcement, flown back to Memphis. I'd spoke to the, uh, spoken to the University of Pittsburgh Business School. Fly back to Memphis, walk into my office, and that same person, Alan Graff, is sitting in my office. Okay, Our CFO is sitting in my office waiting on me for me to come back from the business. I said, hey, Alan. He said, hey. And he shut the door. <laughs> Trouble now. He says, I don't want you to be the controller anymore. I'm like, this is off to a great start. <laughs> he said, let me tell you what I want you to do. I want you to step down as controller, and I want you to go lead the integration of TNT. It's like, you're going to have to move to the Netherlands. We may not be successful, because you know UPS tried to do this and they didn't make it work. If we're not successful, I don't know, I don't know what's going to happen to you. I have no idea what your next step at FedEx is going to be. And I can't guarantee that there'll be anything for you if we're not successful. So, when do you leave? <laughs> So, I call my wife, Suzanne, like, hey, I'm in Memphis, or she's in Memphis. I call her, say, where are you? She's like, I'm at Costco. She's like, okay, well, Costco is five minutes from our house. My office was five minutes from our house. I was like, hey, can we meet for lunch? Can we meet at home for lunch? She said, where do they want us to move? <laughs> actually going to work. And I didn't know what my future was going to be. 
and I ended up saying yes. And when I said yes, my mentor, a guy named Bob Henning, who was the head of our finance department who worked for Allen, he said, by saying yes, I can't tell you how, but I know by saying yes to this, and I know you're uncomfortable, and I know you're uneasy, and I know it makes no sense to you, you have changed the trajectory of your career forever. So that was four years ago next week, April 7th, 2015. Four years ago, I was the Vice President and Corporate Controller at FedEx. Today I sit and serve in a role, it's a tremendous privilege and honor as the President of the FedEx Business in Europe. And I said yes to something that made absolutely no sense in the world to say yes to. But it worked out. The deal was approved. We bought TNT. We're three years into an integration of a global complex network business. And we're having a lot of fun. It's not great every day, but we are having a lot of fun. So I'm going to stop for a minute, see what questions you guys have. If you have questions, I'm happy to answer. Not we'll get out of here. I'm close to you. Yes, sir. If somebody believes European operations, how do you respond to the Brexit process? And then also, how have you dealt with follow up? How have you dealt with the uncertainty of the market, especially in the United States? Okay. So, the question, if you couldn't hear, it's about Brexit. How have we dealt with the uncertainty of Brexit? And the first part was, how have we dealt with it in the planning? How have we dealt with it in the planning? So Brexit is the classic, just the worst thing you could possibly have in, in business. The worst thing you can have in a business is uncertainty. Most businesses with any capabilities can handle really big, bad, complex problems. The things that are hardest to deal with are the things that don't have an answer and are completely uncertain. And that's what Brexit is, including this morning for the third time they don't accept the withdrawal agreement. So what we decided two years ago was that for FedEx, we have to deal with Brexit in a way that protects our customers. That's the number one priority for us. And in doing that, we're going to have to make a decision about what puts us in the best possible shape to protect our customers, which means you're going to have to make an assumption about what the outcome is going to be. So two years ago, we made the decision that it would be a hard Brexit, that there would be no deal. And the reason we did that is because that is the worst possible situation for our customers. And if we plan for that, and these guys actually figure it out, then we can pull back our plans from that. Our preparations think about Brexit really through four prisms. We think about Brexit through our, for our customers. How do we support them and make sure that they understand what's going to happen? to the extent we can help them, it's, it's still uncertain. We think about it in our network. How am I going to continue to deliver packages if things radically change? If the ports where you bring a shipment into are congested because there's so many new clearance activities? If airports are congested in terms of us bringing flights in? How do we manage around that? How do we diversify our network by adding more lanes of trucking, by adding more flights, perhaps adding some ferries? to make sure that I can get goods into the UK. I have to think about it for my IT systems. There are going to be a ten, there's going to be a tenfold increase in the number of transactions to clear goods in and out of the UK. Ten times increase, ten times increase. You have to have servers that can handle that. You have to have network capacity that can handle that because right now the volume is so low. So you have to invest and prepare for that. And I have to think about my team. 25% of the people who work in my business in the UK are from the EU. And I can't just have them kicked out of the UK and lose a quarter of my workforce and still serve my customers. So our preparations have really been about making sure that across those four prisms, we've got continuity and clarity. Now, as an American company, we will never get into the middle of a political discussion inside of the country. Of course, I don't think the British would really be that accepting of an American company telling them what to do. But what we do in terms of trying to influence what's happening is use our expertise. 
and our expertise is in logistics and shipping and infrastructure. So we're trying to influence the debate in terms of going after the things that are practical, which is how goods move in the UK. And the UK is not ready for Brexit. They're literally not ready because they voted it out at the end of the day. But they're logistically not ready for what they voted for because they don't understand the infrastructure challenge. Some of you heard this this morning, so please forgive me. My favorite Brexit statistic, 44% of what is eaten in the UK is imported from the EU through the port of Dover. So think about that. Nearly half of what the UK eats is imported through a single port and it comes from the EU. All right? It's March 29th. Today was the day they were supposed to leave the European Union. It's not happening today. The next mile marker is April 12th. But there are no food inspection stations in the port of Dover right now. And there won't be in 12 more days. And customs clearance, I can guarantee you, they may wade through and allow de minimis goods like an iPad or an iPhone case to come in. But what no country will allow to come in without being inspected is food, agriculture, and drugs. Because why? If it's bad, it'll kill their people. And so there's no way in 12 days to have food inspection stations for food. So guess what's going to happen? If they continue to press ahead in this very impractical way, they're all going to starve to death. <laughs> You, there's not enough cans of baked beans in the UK to survive. <coughs> so the Brexit preparations have tried to been about, we control FedEx, let's have FedEx prepared, let's keep our eye on our customer, and from a political perspective, stay out of that, and focus on trying to influence their government in a very sensible way about just, look, be practical, you're not ready. <laughs> Make the right decisions and let those things drive the politics rather than the opinions of politics, which I still don't think are going to sort themselves out. Another question? Yes, sir. What was the biggest challenge you faced coming to uh, lead the integration efforts and moving to the economy? What, what, what to you was the most challenging part of it? So the question is was the biggest challenge in the integration? and the biggest challenge in moving to a new country. So I'll start with the integration. The biggest challenge we've had in an integration actually had nothing to do with the integration. It was the fact that we had to stop the integration because of that cyber attack. And so when you integrate a business, uh, and if you've been around a business, some of you may have worked before, uh, but if you've ever integrated a business, it's one of the hardest things you'll ever do in your career because you're putting together two things that were never meant to go together. FedEx and TNT ran independently. And we have independent systems, and we have different trucks, and we have different planes, and our people are different. And so you have to figure out a way to put all that together without breaking anything, without upsetting a customer, and getting people who are different, FedEx people and TNT people, to come together and work together and like each other. And to do that really hard work, you take the best and the brightest and the smartest people you have in your business and you put them on the integration. You take them out of their day job and you say, look, you're going to go work on this integration. You're going to learn a lot. It's going to be really challenging. But we need you because of who you are in this business to go put this together. So we are one year and a month, 13 months into integration of a four-year integration timeline. And that cyber attack hit in June, June 27, 2017. <coughs> and I had to take every smart, capable person in the business in Europe and then fly a bunch of people in from Memphis FedEx and rebuild a business from scratch. And that caused the integration. And it took a lot. Integrations have a life. They're its own thing. And when you take that and stop it, the momentum is stopped. And it's like restarting the engine of a cruise ship and how long it takes for that propeller to 
really get back up to full speed. That's been the hardest part of this integration because we had to rebuild it and then we had to restart it. And the other side of it has been I had to put those same people back on the integration and they're fatigued. They're tired. This has been a, a long two years. And so the biggest challenge of the integration is stop, pause, restart, and then how do you keep people motivated? And the way you keep people motivated is that the answer to what we're doing is still fantastic. The combination of FedEx and TNT, and I'll start recruiting for FedEx because it's the absolute best company in the world for The combination of these two businesses is absolutely fantastic. We will be the premier shipping logistics business in Europe. We're number three right now, we will be number two, and we will be number one, I'm working on it. And that's how you keep people motivated about what you're going to go do and the capabilities you're going to have when you have an integrated business, even when they're tired. The second part of your question is professional challenge or personal challenge about moving? Uh, well, how was it more difficult moving to Europe and having to do this integration in Europe? And like how have they the integration? No, so it's easier to do it because that's where the two cores of the businesses are. They're European based. And so there's no way you could have done it from here. There's no way you could have stayed in Memphis and tried to uh, run the business and put them together. It's too hard to not be on the ground where the business is actually going. Uh, it's hard though. Moving overseas, it's hard. Um, it takes a lot of courage. I mean, even if you think, uh, you're like, oh, an international experience. I know somebody in this room is getting ready to embark on this journey. She's really excited about it. But it's still going to be a little bit hard. She and I have already talked about this. You move into a new place where they don't speak English and where you have to figure out how to drive with all these people who ride bikes. And when they get on bikes, there's like two bikes for every person in Holland. So there's like 700,000 people and 1.4 million bikes. And when a Dutch person gets on a bike, it's like Zeus has gotten onto a lightning bolt. And it doesn't matter that you have a big SUV. They're taking you on. You have to learn how to drive. You have to speak some level of Dutch, although English is widely spoken. Your children are moving to a new school wife is leaving her friends for 20 years and leaving your parents behind. You take their only grandchildren. Let me tell you how awesome that is. <laughs> it's hard, personally. But the thing I can tell you is that it has been the most rewarding experience of these last four years I couldn't trade for anything. Both professionally and personally. I've been to 40 countries in my career. 22-year career, 40 countries. I went to my 40th country last week. My kids, when they come home this summer to see friends and family in Memphis, by the time they get home, my 15-year-old and my 8-year-old will have been to 20 countries in three years. Now, many of you are close enough in age to my 15-year-old to relate to her on some level. Or at least you can certainly remember being 15. I can't. But she's got an experience that is going to prepare her for what you're doing like none other. When she goes to college, she's not going to have many peers that have traveled the world and seen different cultures and gone to school in a different environment where you have to go ahead and learn about some of these things I talked to you guys about, about relationships. And so you can't trade it. It's hard, but you can't trade it because the upside of it and the positive side of it is so great. Another question? You spoke about how our preparation is going to be take away from these universities. So what how have has FedEx prepared ever since the June 2017 side of that to prevent the more show? Yeah, so that's a great question. So the question if you didn't hear it was I talked about preparation, so after FedEx got attacked by a cyber attack on June 27th of 2017, how have we done a better job of preparing ourselves? Really good question. I will tell you that when the cyber attack hit, I was in uh, the Sistine Chapel of the Vatican, no lie. Okay? I'll never forget it. 
we're supposed to be taking in this very holy, very serene setting. I mean, we're in the Vatican, people, okay? And my phone rings, and our head of planning and engineering says, all of our IT systems are gone. I'm not supposed to be on the phone in the Sistine Chapel anyway, but I got, got a text message. I said, calling you very urgently. So even the divine nature of where I was standing didn't help us prepare any better, despite the fact that I prayed about it while we were there. <laughs> it teaches you a really tough lesson. And it teaches you about the fact that you have to be as vigilant as you possibly can in a new frontier in the business landscape of cyber terror. Now, that happened to us, okay? You can go look it up. It's widely known that that was a nation state attacking another nation state, and we were just an innocent victim of cyber terrorism between two countries. Now, the reason it was so catastrophic was because, and it happened on the TNT side of the business, not the FedEx side of the business, was because the business we acquired in TNT needed to be more heavily invested in, which is what we've done. There's things that you can do in business. You can throw money at problems, and that's one of the things we did. Is throw money at we needed to do a better job of investing, taking care of that network. And we knew it when we bought TNT, and we were working fast to do it to just get it work fast enough. One more question. Don't do something you don't love. 
because you're going to be miserable. You're going to make the people around you miserable. They're not even going to want to punch you. So passion, I think, is something that cuts us deep. And I think it's also the ability to communicate. If you're going to be in leadership, you have to be able to communicate. You have to be able to say the bad news. You have to be able to say the good news. And the people that work for you, they want to hear from you. In big businesses, there's newsletters, there's emails about what's happening. But people don't want to read them. You get an email this long. You know what happens when I get an email this long? I'm like, oh, good grief. That means I'm really, really going to have to stop and press into this one and not be able to keep it tight and just tell me what I need to know. And our newsletters internally are this long because we're trying to get so much information to all these 425,000 people around the world. <coughs> You have to do it because you have to do it. But what I really want my team to do is take that email, that the fantastic communications people have provided, read it, understand it, and go have a cup of coffee with their employees and talk to them about what's in the email. You have to be able to communicate. Now, as far as rebel creates, experience of one of the best leaders that FedEx has ever produced in my life is now retired. And a rebel great like Archie Manning. Because Mike Glenn leads all this. He went here, he leads it, he believes in it, and he takes his spirit and combines it with a particular set of experiences in the business world and brings a perspective to a process that's unique. Archie Manning did the same thing. Spirit, dedication to this university, but a set of sports experiences that shape the process. And that's actually a great lesson about leadership. That's what you want. If you get into management, that's what you want for your team. You want that diversity of thought. The worst thing that can ever happen to you as a leader is people stop telling you bad news. That's the worst thing that can happen to you. Because everybody telling you yes and that everything's fantastic, that's not reality. That's not true. Everything's not fantastic every day. And so that's, a, that's kind of for me. I'm not going to pick one. Sorry. But that's how I think about that. <coughs> All right, I'm going to close things up because I'm probably way over my top of my head. And uh, just give you guys a closing story, OK? And I want you, I'm not going to ask you to do anything really weird, but I'd like you to close your eyes. Right, just trust me. If you're uncomfortable, you can leave your eyes open, but it would be better if you should be closed off. All right, so I'll tell you a story. Got your eyes closed. In 1820, on a foggy night in London, cold, foggy night in London, a beggar walked into the violin shop of a man named Arthur Betts. Arthur Betts had a violin shop that he'd had for a very long time. And in his shop were numerous violins. You can see them hanging on the wall, on the counter. The beggar had a violin in his hand. He was desperate to trade his violin for money to be able to eat. 
completed with the owner, Mr. Betts, to take a violin and exchange it for a guinea, which is about five dollars, so that he could. Mr. Betts, being a very sympathetic man, empathetic man, agreed to take the violin, handed the guinea to the beggar, and the next thing that Mr. Betts knew was that the beggar had slipped out into a very cold, foggy, dark street in London. Mr. Betts grabbed a candle off of the counter. He peered inside of the violin, looked at the inside of the violin, and then he grabbed a bow off the table, and he pulled it across the violin, and the violin filled his shop with the richest, warmest, most amazing sound he'd ever heard from a violin in his entire life. He grabbed the candle off the counter again, peered inside to the violin again, and finally found the inscription, Antonio Stradivari, 1704. You can open your eyes. That violin is now in the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. It's called the Betts Stradivarius for the way in which it was found. The point of the story is that that beggar had no idea of the value that he had in his hands, and he exchanged it for nothing. <coughs> I left here with no idea of the value of this amazing and fantastic university and school of accounting. And my challenge to you guys, as you leave today, is to find the value of what you're learning. Start your journeys of, of your career. Unlock the value and find your path forward. I want to encourage you to do that. I want you to be successful, and I wish you all the best success in the rest of your time here at Ole Miss, but as you start your careers. I'd love to give you all a business card, but I didn't have enough bags to bring business cards. So if you want to keep up with me, and if you want to connect on with me, the best place to do that is on LinkedIn. If you want to see what's happening in the business in Europe, you can keep up with FedEx. A lot of updates on LinkedIn. We'd love to have you. But I'll say this just to wrap up. This is a fantastic place to be. You made a great decision to be here. And you're going to have tremendously successful careers because you have a foundation and a field that will make you employable forever. So I know it's Friday afternoon. One final story. Mark Twain, at the height of his career, was earning five dollars for every word he wrote. Everything he wrote, he got five dollars per word. It's pretty good, right? So a little boy in Missouri sent Mr. Twain a note, and he put a five dollar bill in it, and he said, Mr. Twain, can you please send me a good word? Mr. Twain sent the little boy a letter back. Maybe not exactly in this envelope. <laughs> With one word written on a piece of paper. <coughs> Thanks. <laughs> a good word. Thank you for having me. Thanks for making time for me this afternoon. It's a delight to be here. And I wish you guys all the best.